district. Um, we also have um, a few other agents that have collaborated to put this together. We have Justine Henderson, livestock agent in Central Kansas, uh, Alicia Bohr in Cottonwood, she's the ag agent. And last one is the livestock agent in Midway and Sandy Johnson is the crops agent in Post Rock District. Um, if you wanna contact any of us, we each have our websites. You can Google any of those um, districts and um, ASU, you will find us. Um, if you have any questions um, about using Zoom, uh, you can email them to Sandy or any of us, uh, Sandra Wick, at any time after the meeting or whenever. If you have any questions, um, we can certainly help you out on that. But if you have any questions, you'll see, depending on if you're on a phone or on your computer, there'll be a chat button um, on in, in either case. Just click that and put in any questions or comments, uh, anything you have for our presenters or for our agents today. Um, we will be doing some polling questions during the presentation. Um, so simply just click on your response. Uh, after we read the question, click on the response and we will show the results of that poll. Um, as soon as everybody completes it, we'll give you about a 30 seconds or so to complete those. I think we have three or four today throughout the presentation. And with that, we will introduce our speaker. Um, today we have Dr. Walton Fick. Um, his, he has a, he's our, uh, a range management specialist for Kansas State Research and Extension. Um, his overall goal of his program is an integrated approach to, of weed management, including grazing management with proper stocking rate combined with the use of prescribed burning. He evaluates new and current herbicides to develop effective methods or management strategies for brush and weed control on range, land, and pasture. And he's also done some research on musk thistle, common mullein, and Cerisia lespidiza and Old World Blue Stem, some uh, couple uh, emerging weeds here in uh, our area. So with that, I will stop sharing and let Walt share his slides and I will uh, hand it over to him. Okay. So is that showing up? Uh, we can see your slides. It's on the it's not on the presentation mode. There you go. Now we can see it. Yeah. Well, good morning. Thanks for the invitation to, to visit with you today. Uh, they asked me to talk about kind of spring burning practices. I've gave a slightly different title here on planning, conducting a prescribed burn, and uh, so we'll go through that. Show you a picture of fire since that's what we're we're talking about, but. We weren't able to uh, conduct our prescribed burning schools uh, this winter like normal because of the COVID situation, but uh, give an opportunity to give you a, at least an overview of the whole basic principles and things we think about uh, when we're going to conduct a prescribed burn. Um, so here's an outline of briefly going to cover, you know, why, why we might want to burn. I'm going to emphasize safety and smoke management because those are key issues we deal with and then actual planning and in conducting the burn. Um, so there's a large list of, of possible reasons we might want to burn, objectives or purposes for burning. Uh, this probably is not even all inclusive, but gives you an idea of the, the breadth of things we might want to burn for, rather than just making the, the soil black, I guess. Uh, you know, suppression of uh, brush and, and weedy species is, is a key issue that many people deal with. Sometimes we may have had a pasture that well, it hasn't been used for a while and has a buildup of quite a bit of material and we might just want to simply uh, revitalize that site, remove the litter and so forth. In some cases we can actually increase herbage yields, improve grazing distribution and, and in the case of stalkers at least we can, can increase livestock gains. So those are some of the key reasons we might want to burn uh, here in Kansas. Um, here's a picture of one of our key species that we were dealing with. Uh, you know, we've used Eastern red cedar over the years, planting them in shelter belts. And unfortunately, they don't always stay there, get spread around by the birds. And uh, fortunately, it's, it's a species that is quite susceptible to prescribed burning, assuming you have uh, enough fuel to carry the fire. And uh, normally we can get, you know, trees that are maybe up to three feet tall pretty easily. Uh, it takes more more fuel if you're going to try to burn down bigger trees than that, however. 
So burning considerations, you know, the first concern really ought to be safety, uh, you know, safety for life, ourselves, properties. And then of course, hopefully the, we're doing a burn that, that uh, it's gonna effectively accomplish what we're trying to do. Um, so safety, gonna talk about it first. And you know, there's personal and public safety, uh, weather safety, you know, proper conditions under which you wanna conduct a burn. And then there are some special situations we might I'll bring to your attention as well. So personal safety primarily is from a health standpoint and in, in individuals, you know, if you have high blood pressure, heart conditions, maybe certain allergies because of the smoke, uh, respiratory diseases, you know, individuals like that probably shouldn't be out there on the active fire line. Sometimes as, as we get older, we get these, these conditions though, and we have had a lot of experience. And sometimes individuals like this can be still important in terms of helping us plan a burn. Um, another item of safety you want to talk about is, is the clothing that we wear when, when we burn. Um, usually clothes with natural fibers uh, should be worn, you know, cottons, for instance, cover your arms, legs, your whole body, cover your head, you know, wear gloves, um, boots or shoes, you know, don't, don't wear tennis shoes. Uh, probably shouldn't even wear steel-toed boots because uh, get close to fire that can give you a hot foot. Um, I say natural fiber clothing but there are uh, fire retardant clothing that you can buy that are actually synthetic materials uh, but they retard the fire but just normal clothing we typically wear like say high percent cotton is, is fine. Um, other item of personal safety would be involving communications. You know in the field we want to be able to communicate with other individuals on our crew um, you know, these two-way radios, um, uh, you, you get what you pay for, you know, you, you can, you know, but you can get fairly decent radios like this, even so $60, $80 a piece uh, is a pretty decent radio. Um, now, if you're needing emergency contact, though, then you're probably going to need a, somebody needs a, usually the, probably the, the fire boss ought to have a, have a cell phone that he can call 911 or some other emergency number if he needs needs help during the burn. Uh, other item of personal safety, uh, we need to know basic firefighting and prescribed burning techniques. I've often said, you know, maybe if, if you don't know how to put a fire out, you know, maybe you shouldn't light one. Uh, and uh, we also need to have, you know, good equipment, make sure it's in, in working condition. And we have individuals that knew how, know how to operate it. Uh, public safety, a key issue in, in one of our, our uh, state regulations, uh, there's only about four of them really, and one of those though is notification. And, you know, that may be, you know, who do you notify? Well, each county is a little different. There may be uh, the fire department, could be the police department. Uh, you may have an, an emergency uh, office, you know, that, that you, you uh, contact. Um, usually you do that, you know, let them know your intent to burn, uh, but particularly, you know, you make, you call up as, as you're starting your burn then. And then I always think it's a good idea to call back when you're done, when you've seen the fires out and you're done. That way, if someone calls in and, and where you've been burning and maybe it's flared back up, they know that you, you thought you were done and they, they would know to respond. So I think it's important to, to let notify, you know, the, the authorities after you're done burning uh, as well. Uh, another issue along with the notification is you know, we need to make sure the fire's extinguished before you leave. Uh, that, that's specifically stated in our, in our regulations. Uh, what about night burning? Uh, sometimes people think that's a, a time to do it because a lot of times maybe the winds go down, the humidity's come up a little bit, lower temperatures, Maybe the fire is not quite as uh, hot and volatile as it might be during during sunlight hours, but from a safety standpoint, there's some real problems with with burning at night. Uh, we can't see landmarks a lot of times. Uh, I don't think you see the picture. There's a windmill in the middle of that picture, for instance. Uh, can't judge distances as well. You know, when when the ground is black, it's it's just hard to hard to judge and see very well. Uh, can't see to maneuver. You know, even individuals who uh, may know their pasture uh, have been known to, you know, go off into a little gully or something at night, 
night when you might get maybe a little excited because of the fire, but uh, there's there's some issues with with burning at night and and uh, typically you know we you'll see fires particularly here in, in the Flint Hills area you know you'll see fires going after night. However, most of those were lit during the daytime and they're burning fairly large acreages and that continues into the evening hours. Uh, the other two things that are that are in the regulations, I mentioned the notif notification, uh, making ensuring the fire is out. And the other two deal with smoke, you know, not creating safety hazards on roads or you know near an airport. Be a good neighbor, you know, think about your neighbor when you plan to do a burn. Hopefully, then you can pick a day when the wind's maybe blowing in a direction that doesn't smoke uh, you or them out, because uh, that could can be a be an issue. Uh, again, and then another thing about, about burning and, and that, you know, where there's fire, there's going to be smoke. And uh, the opposite of that is true too. You know, sometimes we, we see uh, something's creating a little smoke, maybe it's smoldering, you know, through uh, some litter on the ground or under trees, you know, and, but there's that fire is still, still active. And of course, smoke then is, is become a, a bigger issue for us. Um, you know, there, we're getting weekly reports now on, on the amount of acres being burned in, in the state of Kansas. You know, this, this smoke management plan is primarily relates to the Flint Hills, but it's an issue wherever you burn. So I want to talk a little bit about smoke and here's, you know, from over a decade ago, but you look at this map of, of North America there and it's kind of interesting to see some fires down in, you know, in April in, in Mexico and places like that or in, uh, but the red on the, on the maps, that's, fires. So you can see in that particular date, you know, eastern Kansas seems to be pretty well covered. The white on, on there then is the smoke plumes. And some of these travel considerable distances. Uh, there have been years when smoke out of Kansas goes gone clear to the Atlantic coast. So it does move. Uh, and this illustrates so on one day the smoke was kind of headed east. The next day, you know, the wind shifted and then the smoke from fires was headed the other direction. So we have to be aware though that those smoke plumes uh, do indeed move around. Uh, we, we have you know, local issues with smoke, but then also it can have an impact uh, distance wise. And you know, most years, and, and again, this date, that kind of second weekend of April, it seems to be a big time for a lot of people burning in, in Kansas. That seems to be the time when we have our most issues because of the amount of fire that's taking place. And you know, Lincoln and Omaha, uh, Wichita, Kansas City on occasion, those, those are key places that, that have dealt with smoke issues in the past. So some things to talk about in terms of air quality and smoke, it does can impact public health. Most of the emissions are actually carbon dioxide and water. You know, the white that you see in, in the smoke is really for, is the water vapor part of it. But then also we can get formation of ozone uh, particularly on a bright sunny day with warmer temperatures, we can get ozone as a secondary product in the smoke. And then also then these airborne particulates, particularly the PM 2.5 in size. And then you see some other hydrocarbons, you know, the carbon oxide, nitrous oxides. Those are all impact air quality. And then again, you know, we get people traveling in the state or new to state and then, you know, they wonder what, what all this smoke is from and it does cause accidents on occasion. Again, that's why it's important to try to keep it off of roads in particular, because it ob can obstruct visibility. Impacts of inhaling, you know, that ozone, you know, usually again, respiratory related things, people may cough, irritated throat, uh, discomfort in the chest, shortness of breath. You can have long-term effects on, on lungs, inflammation of the airway. So there's some, some serious issues that that individuals might have to deal with in inhaling uh, ozone. Um, how do we minimize concerns with, with smoke? Well, there are some state guidelines that we could try to, of course, need to follow. Burn when conditions for dispersal are optimum. Um, you know, you, you can have some clouds, and I'll talk about that. You can have a few clouds in, in the atmosphere, uh, but you don't want it to be a completely overcast day because the clouds will trap that smoke and, and keep it closer to the soil surface, which causes those you know, near, nearby issues. And then, you know, burn at a time when inversions are unlikely. 
Well, that's one of the reasons, again, we don't want to burn at night, frankly, is because inversions are more apt to occur at night than they do during the daytime. And we'll talk about, you know, there's a mixing height that we also can, can look at so that smoke goes up in the atmosphere and gets dispersed. Uh, burn when the, when the wind conditions take you know, smoke away from your neighbors and, or other you know, major population centers. Um, I like to conduct these burns in the shortest time as I can, you know, under, under safe conditions. Uh, it's kind of interesting, you know, whenever you plan to burn, you know, you may think it's going to take a, a couple hours, more than likely it'll take longer than you expected. But, you know, burn under safe weather conditions, which we'll talk about. So as you look at smoke, you know, here's, here's the impact of smoke with different wind speeds. And at zero miles per hour, you know, the, uh, that smoke's gonna go pretty much up in the atmosphere. It doesn't really even change much when we get to even the 10 miles per hour, it's still pretty much lifting up in, into the atmosphere, dispersing. But as that wind speed gets up to 20, 30 miles per hour, now you see that, that cloud of smoke is starting to lean, uh, getting closer and closer to the ground. And at some point under, high wind days, you know, we've had wildfires here recently with, you know, 40, 50 mile an hour winds. Well, that smoke is right on the ground. And, and of course, that's where it causes some, some serious issues with, with uh, causing accidents and, and so forth because of lack of visibility. Where do we get, you know, weather is a critically important aspect of conducting a prescribed burn. And, and we can get that information from lots of different sources, you know, radio and television, they're usually giving you up updates or whatever the current forecast is, maybe looking to give you information a few days out. Um, the Weather Channel, I've used it in the past because it'll give hourly information in terms of temperature, uh, wind speed and direction. Uh, the best one though, I think is the National Weather Service. I have a link here, you know, it's the weather.com .com and, and it takes you to, to sites and uh, Depending on which county you're in, it varies a little bit where, where your National Weather Service office is. Uh, you know, if you're in Cloud, Ottawa, and Republic County, Topeka is the, is the National Weather Service. Um, if you're in, in uh, I mean, states or counties, Ellsworth, Lincoln, Salina, Russell counties, uh, then Wichita is actually your National Weather Service. And then uh, Phillips, Smith, Jewell, Brooks, Osborne, Mitchell counties are in the north central part of the state. Uh, then your actual National Weather Service is out of Hastings, Nebraska. Uh, but you can go to those. So it, it, you, you go to weather.gov and you'll get a map of the United, United States like this. This one actually is from, uh, that was created for today. And you can see that the, the areas in red are, are actually red flag warnings because probably primarily because of high wind uh, low humidity, uh, maybe warmer, even warmer temperatures, but but still the vegetation is pretty well still dormant, so it really easily ignites, and that's those are the conditions under which we get red flag warnings. Those have been pretty common actually this this here in the last month uh, here in, in the state even. Uh, so then you get this map, you can just click on an area of the map where you're, you're located, and when you do that. Uh, you go to, to a, those sites, uh, usually under the forecast um, part of the menu, you'll have fire weather listed. So that's where you go. And then it takes a while to kind of learn how to, to navigate yourself around these sites, but there's lots of good information there. So here's one for Cloud County, I picked it. And this is actually, yeah, I, I did this last night. So today was actually Wednesday yesterday and then last night and then Thursdays. So here's a forecast uh, from this site for, for Cloud County, for the Concordia area specifically. And you can see it, it gives you amount of cloud cover, no chance of precip, what the temperature is going to be, relative humidity. Again, see today it's, it's relative, 25 is getting pretty low for, for relative humidity. Uh, it gives you wind, wind speed and direction. Uh, again, uh, I think the forecast I've seen for today is just kind of starting off here in the morning hours. It might be relatively low, but by later in the day, we're going to see some higher winds, you know, and gusting. And this one also lists that mixing height I mentioned. And mixing height from, is important to look at from the smoke dispersal business. And we like to see a minimum of 1,800 feet for mixing height. 
Well, this one today is, is over 5,000 feet. So smoke dispersal under those conditions uh, would have been excellent. Another thing you can find is, is, I like this graph, and actually you can get it in a tabular form too. And this one starts at, at, at I set it up so it ran from 8 a.m. or so this morning. So the area in white is, is the daytime hours on, on April 1. And then, you know, then it goes into the, you know, the evening hours and are, on, are in the darker shade. So the top part of the, the graph that you see there, let's say use my cursor here, this, this graph here at the top, this is temperature how it fluctuates. Um, and you can pick what, what weather parameters you want to use. I just I picked specifically temperature, wind, and relative humidity. So here during the day, over here on, on the left side here, uh, again, I don't know if you read these bars, uh, they, they, they point or in the direction of the wind. So those are, you know, started off this morning and says with easterly winds, but they're shifting to the south, uh, pretty much staying under, this one says under 10 miles per hour. Uh, but then you notice uh, tonight, you know, and, and uh, tomorrow, Friday, Friday night. Now we got times when the wind is gusting near 20, 30 miles per hour. So those would be times, again, wouldn't be particularly good for controlling a fire. And then the lower graph there with the green line shows the relative humidity, how it fluctuates over time. So lots of good information on, on, on these weather sites. And again, you, you about need to Go in there and spend a little time but again you look under forecast every one of them has a fire weather page and then you start finding information like this that that is is uh useful to, to use for, for doing a burn and this one allows you know you can actually forward it uh, a couple of days ahead and see what the forecast is going to be so you start start planning ahead of time all the special situations i mentioned have to do with with power lines and most time I haven't, I, I can't say I've necessarily seen this ever happen, which is a good thing. But, uh, you know, one of the things can happen is you get smoke going underneath a power line actually can conduct electricity. And so, you know, standing under a power line when there's burns taking place is not a good place to be because this potentially could happen. Uh, another situation, of course, you want to be careful. Most time our lines are up there high enough where you aren't going to come in contact with them, but you obviously don't want to do that. And then another thing that could happen, you know, if you have to have a down power line and it comes in contact with a wire fence that conducts electricity a long way. I remember growing up, you know, even from lightning storms, you know, we're off in the distance, but they hit a, hit a fence line and we went out to the pasture and there's some cattle that have been along that fence and they actually died from coming in contact with electricity from that case lightning. But so those are some special situations to be be aware of. Many times we don't have power lines out in our pasture, but occasionally we do. Or if not in the pasture, they might be down, down the edge of the road or so. So start talking about planning. We want to do the, you know, plan before you burn. Here's some bunch of people standing around. There is, is, is some fire right there they lit. Sometimes we actually do that to uh, just to see how the fire might react on a given day. But the point of this is, you know, you want to plan before you, you go out there and drop those matches and start a fire. So some things to think about when we're planning to do a, a prescribed burn is you need to have a map. You know, it could be an aerial photo or a map of some kind. And then I think it's important to inventory all the features on that map, you know, that some of those that can be useful to you. Uh, and then some others might be, be hazards um, that, that exist in a pasture. Uh, want to identify, you know, features or areas you want to protect. Uh, are there barriers in the pasture that are prevent movement, you know, whether it's gullies or, or wet spots or steeper slopes? Uh, need to know where your gates are so you, know, you can get in and out of the pastures. Where are you going to build your fire guards? And then, you know, then the opposite of that is because usually opposite direction from your fire guards is, you know, where's the best site to light your head fires? And then you want to have your prescription defined in terms of those actual weather conditions you're going to follow or use when you conduct the burn. Wind is, is a critical issue for us, as, as I tried to point out already. And, and this is a graph chart that was formed in, here in Kansas, at least during we get into the springtime here. We're at the start of April now. Most of the time, uh, our prevailing winds are going to be out of the south. 
or the southwest. You know, so if you have an area or pasture that that for because the road or something, maybe your your road is is on the the uh, west side of the pasture or, or yeah, and you want maybe you want to have the smoke go away from that. So maybe you want a, a northwest wind. Well, they do they do do occur just that it's, they aren't very frequently. I know we have a pasture here south of Manhattan that's on the east side of the 177. And of course, we'd like to get an easterly breeze on that one. Well, again, that just doesn't happen very often. We want to keep smoke off that four lane highway. And uh, and usually when we get something with the east, it means that precipitation is not too far behind. But so you got to kind of pick and choose sometimes to handle the, the direction you want your smoke to go. So here's a thing put together on, on a, an example. So here we have an area, maybe it's a CRP field. You know, it's got heavy fuel load and mulch in it, tall grass, and then around it we have these these different things. And again, what we want to do then is is talk about which ones are hazards and, and which ones might be helpful. Down here in, in the the corner, you know, that that's your house. It's got shake shingles on it. You don't want any sparks flying in that direction. So here then, I've, I've looked at all these things on the map. There's there's a couple roads. You know, one one on the south side and one on the the east west side there, uh, across the road, there's there's wheat stubble, and uh, wheat start, dried wheat stubble can can carry a fire. His spark gets over there, up the road. Uh, my nose here says culvert. Well, what what's the problem with the culvert? Well, it goes underneath this road, and fires. You know, if you have trash and stuff, tends to build up in those culverts. If that happens, catch fire. Sometimes it's just like you shot it through there, and it goes to the other side, and on the other side of the road there, there's some native grass that's probably gonna be burned. So those are indeed uh, potential hazards. On the south side of the area, south and east side of the area we want to burn uh, here and over here, we can see there are areas that, that have, uh, you know, vegetation on it, which probably could, would burn if fire would, would get across your uh, area you want to burn. And then even to the north side, there is a gate located over in this direction that might allow people to get in here if they needed to and so forth. Uh, but the point of this, you know, there are areas that, that are beneficial and then some that, that are, could be a problem. You know, on, on the south side here, there, there is a, gra it's a gravel road there. But again, you know, probably if it's very heavily traveled, you aren't gonna wanna put smoke across it or at least have it, some signs there indicating you know, that, that there could be that, that issue. Uh, so we'll come back to you know how we how we deal with with that, but in, in general you know that's the area we're going to burn. A southwest wind direction would be good in terms of taking away from the house and in the gravel road and so forth. And the green would indicate areas that you probably would want to build uh, some fire guards to help you uh, maintain the fire where you want it to be. And again, we'll we'll talk about actually process or procedure for lighting a fire. Um, so when you get ready to, to do a prescribed burn, you know what you need to think about safety, what those regulations are again that you have to deal with. Uh, for instance, now in each of your counties may be different, but uh, does your county require a burn permit? Some counties do, some don't. Uh, here in Riley, in Pottawatomie County, uh, they're usually, well, Riley County is good for, for a year. Uh, so once once I have that, I just need to call them up when I'm tending to burn. Uh, some counties will will give you a a burn permit for the day that you're planning to burn. Uh, some others, you know, they just they're, you should notify somebody again, whether that's the emergency management, fire chief, possibly the police department. But you need to know what those what those requirements are. So you're doing a burn, you know, how much how many how much people, how many people does it take? And do you have the equipment to conduct a burn? And, and again, uh, up to a certain point, at least more people is better than, you know, a person or two is, is it's difficult to burn safely under most situations if you only have a couple people. Um, I'll mention at this point, one of the things that we do, you do have out in your area, there are prescribed burn associations. I know Jewell County has one, for instance. I think there's one in Russell County the places like that, uh, there are burn associations where where people go go together, you know, to conduct these burns. 
uh, provide, you know, that way you've got the extra labor and, and equipment to do them. Uh, notification procedure, how and when you're going to do that, who again you're going to notify. Need to have contingency plan. You know, think about what's the worst case scenario? What could happen? What, what could go wrong? If something goes wrong there, you know, this fire gets across this fence line, how am I going to deal with that? Uh, do I have the equipment that maybe I can get on and do it myself? Or do I need to contact and get some more help? Here are the, the prescriptions. I'm talking about you need to have a prescription. So the, the wind speeds we'd like to see are generally 5 to 15 miles per hour. Uh, you know, lighter winds, you know, when you see a forecast that says, you know, light variable winds, those are just not good conditions under which to conduct a burn because they're just, they're just too variable. We don't know how the, the fire is going to react. But if it's out of a, you know, steady out of a given direction, you know, in that five to 15 miles an hour, generally that's, those are good conditions under which we can control the burn. Again, I mentioned cloud cover a little bit before. Uh, we don't want it completely co covered. Something up that 60, 70% is okay. One of the things that does is though, again, allows the smoke to still dis disperse, but also can help reduce temperatures. If you're burning, you know, on a, on a warmer day, you know, having, it gets hotter, you know, again, we get temperature here, maybe up to 80 degrees. That's starting getting 75, 80 degrees or above. Fires are, are move much faster, things burn hotter. So having a little cloud cover can help reduce that. You know, minimum ceiling there again, and, and then I'll mention again, mixing height, uh, which I don't have on here, but that mixing height should be, you know, something greater than, than 1800 feet. Temperature, you know, 55 to 80 degrees, that's, that's an optimum, that's comfortable temperature for us to work under. Uh, you can burn under cooler conditions than that. I burned when it was like 45 to 50, worked fine. Uh, but you can't get too cold, you know, because uh, there's something called wind chill. When you start dropping, if it gets below, let's say, 40 degrees and, and you got some wind chill and maybe you're traveling down a road and uh, you get to the side and you notice you got icicles forming in some of your hoses or water, wherever you have water. So it can be too cold. And like I say, if it gets too hot, uh, it becomes more uncomfortable for us. Uh, we might get tired quicker. Uh, but again, that fire... The fire behavior is is uh, is more difficult to deal with, and it gets too warm. Relative humidity, you know, forty to seventy percent. Generally, that's not an issue. But I've seen as as we go west in this state, you know, relative humidity might be just as important or more important than wind speed in terms of fire behavior. Uh, again, you start dropping much below forty percent, you're getting 35, 30, or that twenty five that they're predicting today. Uh, then you start getting spot fires. Um, spot fires, you know, what that is, is, you know, you have an area you're burning and a spark, an ember flies out of yours across your fire guard into adjacent area and lights fires. Uh, that becomes a lot more uh, probable uh, when you have very low humidities. Um, so that's something to be, be aware of. Equipment, so just got a picture here, a few, few of the equipment, you know, there's equipment to light fires, the ignition equipment, picture there, with a drip torch, I, I really like the drip torches. Um, you know, you can buy those, they're, they're, they're kind of expensive. Although some counties, uh, and I don't know whether any, any of your extension agents or, or maybe the conservation district offices, sometimes they have these on hand that you can, can borrow them. Um, the fuel that, it, that goes in that we use to burn with is usually a mixture of, of uh, diesel fuel and, and gas, uh, typically maybe Oh, two thirds to three fourths of the mixture ought to be diesel, and then the rest would be gas. Uh, you don't want to use too much gas; that's too too volatile. Uh, but the drip torch is nice, and that that fire drips off the end of that the torch, and you know you get a nice continuous line that you're lighting, and it works quite well. Uh, peep, some people have used propane torches. Um, I've seen those used. I, I I'm not a fan of propane torch, but they can be used. One of the problems it seems like you. You can, they kind of whoosh, you know, you whoosh, whoosh as you as you go along, and and you get more spots being being lit on fire rather than a than a nice continuous line. Other ways of, of lighting, but those are are kind of the key ones. Uh, so then, if you have ignition equipment, we need something to suppress the fire. A minimum, I, I listed 200 gallon. You know, 500 gallons of water would be probably better. 
we can have a smaller units like the four wheeler pitcher there that might have you know 20 25 gallons of water on them those are good for you know going along putting out the back fire uh, but you need something with with more water in case uh, you have some uh, more intense flames to deal with oh there are backpack sprayers that that you can buy uh, allows you you know five usually carry five gallons of water they allow you to get into areas maybe where you can't get in with equipment you don't know, have to walk into something under creep under the trees and you want to go in there and put it out uh, the picture here of a swatter uh, that's a bad name but that's that's what they call it because you don't don't swat fire if you're swat fire you're just giving it oxygen and it'll keep burning uh, so but it's just a basically like a rubber flap there with with a handle you drag it on the ground and you smother out the fire with with that again on the back fire uh, where, where where your light maybe you have your your area maybe you've mowed it off you know suppress the the vegetation you're lighting a backfire there that's going meaning it's going into the into the wind well it's going to try to go both directions so it creeps with the wind well as it does that as it's creeping with the wind you want to put that out well the swatter can be done used to do that or you know something with water uh, rakes can also be used uh, to, to move mulch and stuff around uh, various wetting agents and one of the common things you can do is is if you have a tank with water you can add a little bit of soap to it and and that actually increases the, the surface tension and, and it makes your water spread further go, you know last longer you mentioned fire retardants you've probably seen on on tv uh, you know when they're fighting fires in california a lot of times uh, airplanes going by and they're they're dropping this orange colored material out there in front of the fires well that's probably a a, a product the trade name of that is foz check and it's FOS because it's it's a it's a phosphorus containing fertilizer almost you know I think ammonium polyphosphate is one of the key ingredients that we have in 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 FOS check and what it does it you put it on the vegetation and and uh, you know that it won't burn the vegetation won't burn them uh, and it'll stay that way in, until you get some rain or some water that takes removes the FOS you know that material so those can be used in some situations as well. Okay, so here's the fire guard. So again, we're gonna talk about lighting a fire again. If we have a southwest wind, we have our fire guard then in, in the north and the east. Again, now here's an example of a fire guard. The only picture I put in are lots of different kinds of fire guards. This is a burned out one, you know, where the area along the, this area had been mowed off and then they burned it off. Could have used maybe what's called a, a double wet line technique where you put water down on both sides of the area that you're going to burn and burn out in between. Uh, but this, so this is a burn fire guard with area to be burned then on the right. Now, in the rule of thumb though, is that that fire guard ought to be 10 times the height of the vegetation. So if the vegetation's two feet tall, then your, your fire guard ought to be 20 feet to be safe. Even with that, you know, I wouldn't want to run a fire, you know, if I run a fire uh, from the right and this, this picture then toward that blackened area, uh, I would probably not do that yet. I would still, I would come along here and, and you know, light a, light a fire again along here, let it creep this way for a ways before I run a head fire into it. You know, widen that black area just to be safe. Lots of types of fire guards, you know, if you have CRP, old farm ground probably well then we yeah we can mow and uh, we may actually till some people have a, a tilled area maybe 20 30 foot wide and then even a burn i'm sorry a, a mowed out area beside it and that becomes your fire guard that's easier to do and you know in those situations out in our pastures a lot of times it's even difficult to mow uh, but one could do that another way we can sometimes create fire guards in a pasture is is actually uh, feed feed in those areas like in the winter time spread some pellets out on the ground and so forth and and animals will graze that might graze off the vegetation as well the only downside of that is if they leave too much manure uh, you know those old cow patties can smolder once they catch fire so you have to be aware of that possibility um, we can use natural barriers as much as possible whether that's again roads and, and so forth um, water things things along those lines uh, even areas that have a lot of rock and can be 
can be somewhat uh, fire guards for us, although usually the fire will creep through there. But fire guards are critically important for controlling our fires. Different kinds of fires. Here's an example of what's called a flank fire, where these individuals are walking, uh, you know, the fire away from the fire guard directly into the wind. Um, in this case, though, it's it's important that these individuals are close enough so they can see each other. They're traveling at the same pace. You don't want to get somebody to get behind because then they might get caught in a in a head fire. Uh, but that's one one option. It's very safe. Uh, it takes a long time to, to do that, however, in terms of burning an area. Uh, strip head fire, and, and this, this one is kind of a combination. I'll have another picture, because we use a strip head fire technique actually to, to widen out that fire guard as I was talking about. Um, so these, these types of, of burning techniques, you know, we can control the size of the fire, uh, somewhat the amount of smoke that's, that's being put up, uh, we can use that strip head fire to widen that fire break quite rapidly. Uh, and then this is a fairly safe technique. But again, labor and, and time to, to, to do them is involved. Uh, here's the kind of getting toward the end of a ring fire technique. This is the probably the most common technique that's used to burn. Um, the ring fires in safe method, it's fast, generates heat. Notice that some of these, this heat business and speed are listed both advantages and disadvantages. Uh, as long as you have a good fire break though, uh, that, that fast uh, method or yeah, the fast, uh, the speed of the, of the method is, is a real advantage. And again, when that fire comes in, in, a, in a ring fire, you know, kind of burning from all sides, you know, fire will kind of create its own wind and, and it'll lift that smoke column right up in the middle of the column and, and lift it off the area. So again, here's the situation where the area's in black there with the fire guard. Again, so the fire, this guy's, you start widening this fire guard and this is, is really what you do. You go, you go back and forth, you know, along those fire guards and you're just widening out the area that's already burned, getting more black on the ground. This suggests at least 150 feet. And then, you know, then the next step there, and this first, there's a picture, what was a backfire look like? There's pretty good fuel load out there in this pasture. This fire's creeping along, low flames though, right? We could come along with with the water, with a you know, sprayer and stuff, and we could put that out if we needed to, just about any any time. It's not moving very fast. The flames are low, and easy to put out. So then, as as you widen that fire break though, widen the area that's already burned. Uh, then you know, again, it's nice to have enough individuals. You can go both directions. You know, so. So where they, where they started up here, you know, one guy goes, one person's going this way, the other one then is going to go this other direction, We're creating this ring. Notice that there's people down here. Sometimes those can be in the smoke. You got to be a little careful, but, you know, have, have their water available to make sure that this fire is not going to, you know, didn't creep across the fire guard. That's their, their purpose. And sometimes, you know, people running back and forth with a four-wheeler, that's their job, doing that along those, those edges. So you know, here's a head fire. You know, once you light that head fire, now you can get flames 10, 15, 20 feet in the air, maybe depending on the amount of fuel. Uh, move very quickly, particularly uphill, and uh, you know, pretty hard to you know put that out at that point in time. So now these people have, have completed this ring, and you got a head fire that, that goes across and and rapidly uh, uh, completes the burn. One question that some people come up, and I should have pointed out with the earlier slide, is, well, what about wildlife species? You know, they could be, you know, you've got a ring of fire that could actually capture them in there and, and, and lose some animals. Well, what 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 happened is 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 as those people are are starting to use their flank fires uh, again along which those are along the, when they're coming along these edges here, you can stop. And so you have fire like this. And if there's deer and things like that, they've got an area to escape. You know, birds, of course, they can fly out. Uh, the type of animals that are most uh, likely to be damaged by, by burning are, are uh, reptiles, snakes. Uh, occasionally, you might get a turtle, although, again, if a fire moves quickly, I think that the shell and the turtle protects them most of the time. Only one I've ever seen was actually a snake, and that didn't bother me too much. I'm, I don't like snakes. 
Okay, post burn. So the fire's done. Good time to make sure you clean up and repair your equipment if anything happened needs to be done. Evaluate your burn. Did it go as planned? Were there any problems encountered? Such as, you know, communication. Or did those walkie talkies or whatever two-way radios, did they work all the time or were, were there issues? Um, did, you know, did it, did, were there escapes, you know, were there were potential problems that you could need to figure out how to deal with that, uh, do something different so that doesn't happen the next time. Keeping good records is important when you do burns. And, and so you have a, written down, you know, what, 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 how, how you did it and, and what happened well and what maybe something that didn't go so well. At the end of the season, you know, it kind of goes back to your goals, you know, what your goals were. Did the vegetation respond as you expected? Uh, are you going to need a burn, you know, sometime down the road again? Are you going to conduct it? And, you know, you can start thinking about uh, the next time around. You know, here in the Flint Hills, we have people that burn basically every year because of livestock gains. In other places, you know, maybe people are burning uh, maybe every fourth or fifth year, for instance, maybe to just keep the cedars off, off of a pasture. So it doesn't have to be as near as frequent. So prescribe, you know, have an objective, what, what is your goal? You need to plan well, you conduct the burn and you evaluate the results. I did put on here this ksfire.org. Uh, it has a smoke model in it, but it only really works for counties here in the Flint Hills. But it's a website, has lots of information for individuals related to doing prescribed burns. It has links to, uh, to, the, uh, to the weather stations as, as well. So it's a good site to get information from if you need it, anything related to prescribed burning. So prescribed burning, and we got safety, kind of need to be concerned about, about safety issues for, for people conducting the burn and those around us. Where's that smoke gonna go? Uh, we need to plan. And then, you know, again, timing kind of depends on, on what your goals are. I didn't really talk about timing. Uh, we're talking here today pretty much about these, this kind of end of dormant season, late spring type burns. But there are other people conducting burns, you know, now and during the, you know, I'll say the growing season burn or even getting into the fall, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. But I think that concludes my talk. Uh, there's my contact information. Glad to answer Maybe any questions that you have at this time. All right, if we have any questions from the audience, you can either put them in the chat or if you're brave enough, you can undo your video and ask it in person. Um, if any, any of the agents also have questions, you guys can also ask those at this moment. Okay, first question, how long does a burn take on average? Well, it depends on the size of the area you're burning, of course. Um, you know, if, if you have a, an 80 acre pasture or something like that, I, I think again, and it, it also depends on maybe how much work did you do ahead of time? Did you prepare the, the fire break ahead of time? You know, so that you can just go out that day and start lighting your backfire. A lot of times will people, they'll they create their backfires the same day. You, know, you just go along using water, you know, and you, you light, on the other side of the water you're putting down. Um, but it, it can take a couple hours, you know, on something even that size. Depends also, I think, on the experience of the individuals, uh, how, many, how big your crew is. Um, but yeah, it, it can take a considerable amount of time, you know, maybe from as low as one hour up to several hours, depending on the size of the area. All Again, right. back to weather, you know, that's. That's one, one thing, you know, if it's gonna take a long time, you need to keep constant eye, you know, watching the weather and make sure that, that the weather forecast, you know, if, if there was a front schedule that'd be coming in, you know, maybe you light that fire mid morning, but there's a front coming in later that day or in the afternoon, a lot of times we get a wind shift and you should be like to be done before that occurs. So that knowing how long it's gonna take is, is important. Okay, um, next question. If you want to control more of the woody species, um, when is the most recommended time to burn? Well, most woody species basically need to be leafed out if we're gonna do much damage to them. Uh, the exception to that would be Eastern red cedar. You know, it's an evergreen and, and actually we can control Eastern red cedar about any time of the year when we burn, if assuming we, we can get enough of it desiccated. 
doesn't have to desiccate the entire tree, it turns out. Um, but, you know, again, for, if, if red cedar was my, my primary target, and I wasn't concerned, I, I might burn, burn a little bit earlier, even than, than, you know, right now or even earlier, because the, the, the red cedars, as, as we get later into the spring, they start to get greener. <laughs> I think the oil content goes up, there's more, more water in them. And sometimes you can sit there with a drip torch and you can't even light a cedar on fire. But, you know, let's say late February through the month of March, and that's that's a time like CRP needs to be burned generally prior to April 15th anyway. If cedars happen to be in there, hadn't been burned for a while, you know, burning that time of the year works pretty well. Now these other woody plants, you know, things like buckbrush or, or, or snowberry that you'd have in north central Kansas, they're, you know, lower growing um, they kind of form little moths or colonies of, of brush. Um, they'll leaf out, you know, here kind of mid late April. And if you can wait till that late in the season to burn, you can do a lot of damage to buck brush. Smooth shumac, another common shrub, though, it, it's later. Uh, you know, it's susceptible. If, if you could burn in, in June, <laughs> you know, you could control it, but it's pretty hard to burn in June. We can burn in in late July and August and so forth, but June's pretty darn tough just because everything's so green. Uh, you just don't have enough litter there to carry it. Uh, dogwood's kind of in between. Um, so so in some of these plants though, and some of our trees, you know, hedge and locusts and some of those sort of things, you know, when they're seedlings and haven't developed much of a root system, if they're first coming into pasture, fire, you know, in that late spring can do some damage. But if they've got much size to them, you know, you might top kill it, but they're going to re-sprout. And actually, these, these summer fires might actually do more damage to trees like that than one, you know, the, the spring burn. But basically, they, they, you got to think about it, they about have to be leafed out if you're going to do much damage. Awesome. Okay, another question. How long do you need to patrol a pasture once the burn's complete? Well, yeah, you want to make sure it's out. And, and again, usually immediately after the burn, you, you have individuals go around your perimeter. You know, and what you're looking for are smoldering objects. You know, if they're cow pies or whatever, you can take a rake, take them, pull, you know, get them put out or, or I mean, dump water, a lot of water on them. Uh, but it, it, a lot of times if you have woody material, particularly because woody, woody material, even small branches, they sit there and they burn a long time. It takes more heat to get them started, but once they start, they burn for a long time. Drag them away from the perimeter. You'll get them toward, more toward the interior so that you're cleaning up your perimeter that way. Uh, but then again, you, you hope, that, you know, as you can see, if there's no, nothing smoldering out there, you know, then the fire should be, should be safe to leave. Uh, one thing and I think I mentioned earlier, or maybe I didn't, is one thing that is important. If you're burning an area that does have woody material in particular that could smolder and, you know, stays on, on fire, even though it's not real obvious, but the, the day after you burn, you know, if, if the forecast changes, maybe the wind comes up, the humidity drops, and boy, it reignites some of that stuff, catching you know, coals or something, you know, something was slowly burning, that can spark up and start to fire again. So watching that weather forecast a day or so after you burn also is important. But, so it takes some time to, to, to check out that perimeter. Again, you know, most time if, if you're burning primarily, it's mostly grass, it's pretty straightforward and, and it's pretty obvious when it's out. You just you see very little smoke coming off of anything. So, uh, but take some time. And, you know, again, if you aren't too far, you, you think it's done, okay, and may, maybe go back and check it on an hour later or something just to make sure. Awesome. Well, if anybody else has any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt. And um, I'll let you guys know if you have any questions after this, if something comes up and you have a dire need to find out the answer, uh, you're more than welcome to email any of the agents as well as Walter. Um, we definitely will get back to you on those questions and let you know the answers. And if you are watching this as a recording later on after the meeting, um, you guys are also more than welcome to email those questions to us and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. I did send Brad a copy, you know, PDF, you know, of, of the presentation that, that you can probably get to people too if they want to take some notes on it or whatever as they're, as they're watching the recording in particular, yes. Yeah, those should have been in your inbox if you, if you did provide us with your email. You should I should have had your email. Um, it should be in your inbox if you want to go check. Um, 
I emailed those out before we started this morning. Okay. Well, I think I don't see any more questions. I don't, do you, Justine? Nope, I don't okay. see any. Okay. Well, I did just post into the chat a Qualtrics survey um, just for um, you guys to fill out um, for us um, this time. Um, this is just a um, quick survey about yourself and a few questions about the presentation and then a little bit about um, future programming. It takes two minutes to fill out. Um, but we would appreciate it if you clicked on that link and build it out. It helps us um, know if our programming is effective and also helps us um, with future programming if you have any ideas on that. Um, also with that, um, share real quick. We will be back on next week with uh, our virtual programming next Thursday, April 8th at 10 a.m. same time um, next week. We'll have Dr. Keith Harmony on, and he'll be discussing some pasture weed control. Um, I'm not sure exactly which pasture weeds he's going to be talking about, but I believe it's mainly going to be focused on our north central area of Kansas, some of the big problems that we're having in our area. So uh, again, we will uh, plan on seeing you next week. If you have any questions, you can contact us by email or phone at each of our offices. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'll, I'll check off now. Yep. Thanks, Walter. Thank you, Walt.